Hi, Tamara. Thank you so much for helping my project. Uh, could you say a little bit about yourself? Hi, Nathan. Uh, again, so nice to finally meet you. Um, to talk about myself a bit. So let's just say I'm a kind of space kid, not kid so much, but let's say yeah. approaching the 30s and really diligently but fastly trying to uh, incorporate myself more uh, and let's say the space industry uh, as a whole. Um, I'm a space lawyer or more, let's say, space researcher and writer. I come from Serbia where, well, Serbia is not a space faring nation, um, but I am trying to kind of connect with some experts and bring space law in Serbia and start that sector there as well. Um, I've been writing blogs on space, holding some, holding some lectures on related to space law, mainly sustainability, and let's say a comparative analysis, multidisciplinary approach between environmental conservation, sustainability, space security, and space law uh, as a whole, attending really many uh, seminars, webinars, uh, everything that I can actually, you know, from my from my country, and currently uh, also helping uh, the United Space team expand to Serbia and bring some really interesting entrepreneurs and businesses to kind of help get going the space sector in Serbia, also doing due diligence and following the project all over the globe, helping people start up uh, new space agencies, so the, you know, the goods that we have and the experts that we have can kind of circulate and bring um, bring patents and resources to underdeveloped and developing states. So it's back and forth, but it's mutually beneficial. Really exciting. Uh, so I guess, first of all, could you kind of talk about what fascinates you about space law? Wow. <laughs> A lot of that. I actually, um, when I was young, I uh, used, I, I love like unconventional approaches in everything in life and pretty much reinventing things. Um, let's say finding the legal lacuna, the black holes in space law, you know, so I actually sat with my professor on master's and I was like, can you help me find a topic that can actually benefit that nobody's really concerned about? you know, uh, in our country, but that I could actually use a multidisciplinary approach and use other types of law, other branches of law, right, uh, to kind of understand it better and my knowledge they had up until now. And my knowledge up until then was international humanitarian law. That's what I chose as specialization on my master's and also international environmental law and human rights. So it seemed like a great fit picking a space law and I was doing environmental damages uh, as per liability convention in space, which kind of pushed me and uh, have this really great leap. And, and after that, I used, you know, my master thesis for a, chap a chapter of the book on green crimes and international criminal law published by Vernon Press and actually edited by uh, Regina for laws. And um, it's like, I was really happy about it. So I continued writing articles for Jersey Law Commission, and I continued writing blogs, actually for American um, I um, International Criminal Law blog, Regina's blog, actually, and uh, participating in many seminars, including Washington State Bar Association seminar talking about space debris, space sustainability, um, stuff like that, mitigation of space debris, space security, pretty much that's it. What interested me is um, I kind of want to participate in things where I can at least like be a small drop in the ocean and help out and to feel that I'm changing things because in legal profession, especially in Serbia, before COVID especially, it was not remote. And I'm this active person. who's also a traveler. I love meeting new cultures and you know people. So I, I loved taking my law with me and I love writing. Um, I missed creativity. So I kind of saved my creativity through writing through space law. Now, you mentioned you were doing humanitarian law and then you moved over to space law. Um, oh, I guess, uh, what are some of the similarities that you see between those two law, you know, areas of practice and what are some differences? Uh, which one, sorry, international humanitarian law or uh, environmental and space law? Um, international uh, humanitarian law. Uh huh. Okay. Well, let's say that it's a different actually connection between international and humanitarian law and space law and international environmental law and space law, because here you have two common goods in international environmental law and space law, 
to be protected. So what's similar is a similar approach of law and its protection of the goods. But when it comes to international humanitarian law, uh, per se, we have the basic principles of space law, of course, and then, you know, um, the three conventions that all promote peaceful uses of outer space, international cooperation, of course, uh, due diligence, uh, which pretty much, uh, you know, can be summed up into, well, not using uh, lethal weapons, weapons of mass destruction, which is also problematic on Earth. So when you're building a whole new sector and a new branch of law, like let's say such a, you know, a specific topic where states are concerned, uh, you really have to see what practice gives you to understand how you can use it, either through transplants or just interpretation to understand better what is new. Actually, the laws on Antarctica have been used, you know, to create space law. So pretty much the principles of peaceful use and exploration, uh, you know, and like not using, uh, you know, um, not using let's say, weapons of mass destruction and building military bases just like for scientific reasons and stuff like that um, is some, some let's say, attachments. But uh, if you think more about it, there are principles in international humanitarian law, um, like due diligence and like the proportionality uh, using discriminative weapons that can choose, you know, when you combine all of them, not really combine, but take them into consideration, then you understand the due diligence of space a little bit better and how to actually understand peace in space when it comes to extreme uncontrolled situations. It's definitely mutually beneficial. I think that's their main connection. Of course, when it comes to space security, it can be also taken into consideration. Yeah, it's interesting. Peaceful uses of space. I think people think, um, you know, like weapons in space would definitely violate that. But then you also have like other uses um, that are kind of commonplace now that I wonder how you feel about, you know, like uh, the communication satellites that are used by like the military, the, the um, you know, the spy satellites, the, uh, I mean, yeah. but in, I mean, how, how do these uses um, relate to that concept of peaceful uses of space? Uh, I was wondering what your take was. It's really like a problematic question. It's really making a right balance, right? Because space has the problems with transparency, how to monitor what people are actually in countries are doing in space, who is open enough, like is China sending on information, is, is uh, Russia sending on information, is USA sending enough information? So that's why also space security and actually cybersecurity principles as well are important for space as well. Uh, creating that proper balance that is still being kind of created and worked on on Earth, you know, when you when you take into account space security, you have the cyber triad and you have to like protect the human rights, right? And you have to protect privacy, but have the balance of uh, you know, when you take into uh, into consideration confidentiality principles and like but also providing available data and transparency. Uh, and authorized access, right? So you take this principle and take it to space to see things a bit differently. Uh, and when it comes like to communication satellites and everything, it all kind of amounts up to collaboration with state, states, their cooperation, being transparent, like in a mutual benefit and benefit of all states and all people, you know, so we don't look at it as a plan, necessarily plan B. Yeah, we look at it like, let's not make the same mistakes we made on planet earth so let's consider what other branches of law and what other disciplines are teaching us let's like have this holistic multidisciplinary approach you know and use it sustainably because it's not going to be beneficial to everyone uh, of course uh, there's a principle of non-intervention there are some questions that are states concerns and states questions that they don't affect other states that's of course confidential that proper balance, I think, is like a main question everybody's asking today. How to make it and to which extent the privacy goes, to which extent the confidentiality goes, how to make the balance between the two, the security and privacy. So I think it goes the same for like, let's say telecommunications and other types of satellites that is kind of regulated through the ITU, mostly the constitution and the radio regulations are pretty thorough. But what I think uh, kind of space law needs, because it's like a really fast developing sector and it's dependent on so many different industries and of course so many different nations and more are gonna come into the play, um, is pretty much 
how are we going to kind of make law a bit more flexible? How are we going to reinvent stuff in order to make it more soft to adapt to changing circumstances and in times of crisis? I think that's kind of the right questions everybody should kind of think about now. You know, do we attach to principles or really strict detail rules that takes years and years, even for you and OSA to, to, to bring take, you know, so. Right, and you also, you also have the issue of enforcement and, you know, I kind of, doing, yeah. doing those yeah. things. I, it seems like, uh, you know, China and the United States could pretty much do whatever they want to. Uh. Yeah, well, I think every, that's another problem that has to do like with, uh, you know, leadership and leaders, right? And strong countries, uh, superpowers, let's say space power. It's a problem of actually when you get a certain amount of power, how are you going to use it? You know, are you just going to use marketing and promotion, you know, to market it? Like there's it's there's freedoms, there's everything. And then what you're going to do underneath the curtains and is it going to be, you know, beneficial for future generations really? Or should we like take care of the plan A first and, you know, the planet A first before we just jump? into plan B and should we take the lessons from earth and take them into space what are those lessons because I think every country has like a big thing on its shoulders now is like do I want to be the strongest do I want to win some kind of a game or can we just see what the competition of that sort brought us on earth no. now that that makes sense um well, I had a few questions I wanted to uh, run by you. I guess, first of all, did you know that NASA's planning to send astronauts back to the moon? Yeah, I know. I also, I was reading and uh, citing uh, Artemis Accords as well. Um, I did take a look at your website as well. <laughs> so, of course, yeah, I'm following up on the mission and Alex from our projects is literally happily counting down the days. Uh, so, yeah, pretty much following up on it. As much as uh, I can. <laughs> when, when did you find out that we were seriously planning to go back to the moon? I don't know exactly when. I know that like my, let's, I am a bit of a, a legal geek. So let's say I was doing this sustainability article last year and I was citing Artemis Accords at that time in the sustainability article. So hmm. pretty much at that time, I knew something about it. I was following up and um, yeah. So at that time, and also the topic kind of popped up a few months ago when I started working with the USD on the project. I uh, interview people randomly on the street at the coffee shop, uh, you know, at the park, et cetera. And about 80% of them have no clue that we're going back to the moon. I was wondering if this surprises you. Well, Having in mind uh, kind of where I come from, nothing bad said with it, but uh, let's say that the smaller countries, uh, maybe, and um, underdeveloped countries or developing countries, they kind of still have uh, human rights issues to tend to, rather than just jumping to space, so pretty much dealing with their own stuff. So trust me, like, um, in Serbia, it was hard for me to explain the project I'm doing as well, you know, because people don't want to jump that far you know it's interesting to them to follow what Elon Musk is doing you know pretty much um because like he's good at promotion and he's everywhere right on Twitter and with Twitter and having Twitter but um you know when it comes like to NASA what I notice is actually what, what I would love to see changed I remember when I was writing that article of the book I was trying to find fresh data on space debris and the last data on NASA's website was from 2000. 13. So I think you're doing a very good thing here, helping them with promotion. Um, so yeah, I think they need to kind of be more active with the accurate and fresh data. Um, they're more professional, so they focus on the professional uh, society, but I think that they need more people like you who are as well going to kind of outsource, you know, and, uh, you know, raise awareness about this. I think this is really important. I don't know, do you know, like, Morija Ba? It's, it's an amazing guy. I was looking at his some of his lectures following his like webinars. He's really good at promotion and awareness against like space debris. I mean, space debris mitigation. So people like that, we also need that in the space community. Space community is now becoming more di diverse. 
So we need to have more inclusiveness and non-discrimination towards different professions, which is now becoming even arts, you know. Art provides a lot of promotion as well. Arts, you know, lawyers as well, that's active pretty much. And other professions, you know. So I think if NASA would kind of put some more activities towards promotion and freshness of data, it would be maybe a bit different. Maybe even Roscosmos as well. S, I think, is is okay with promotion. I, I found fresher data there. So, yeah, and uh, you, you mentioned the space debris um, and that Morabaja uh, works on. I mean, that that's, I got to imagine, a big common problem between like the environmental law and the, the space law that, that you were touching on earlier yeah. about protecting the commons. Yeah, exactly. Protecting the common goods. And that's kind of common goods is like the main, that I say, like nexus between space law and environmental law, because you can now take and use these beautiful developed principles from environmental law that we're not using properly on earth. And like, keep in mind again, the, the let's say pyramid, the triangle, the three pillars of sustainable development, right? To like incorporate the private sector as well, you know, to make law more flexible, to include them better, uh, to protect and give them maybe more obligations in terms of how is that gonna happen also, since we have these five beautiful but or old conventions with a lot of lacunas in them, a lot of black holes that can be, you know, if you give it in, in wrong hands or in, you know, crisis or bad situation interpreted, you know, in a bad way and, you know, used in a, in a bad, in bad faith. So, yeah, so I think like um, keeping in mind always the main principles, the pillars, the, the main principles of environmental law, um, and that's much easier actually for people and for the scientific and for the like expert community uh, to always keep in mind the principles and get attached to them, you know, and then uh, when drafting something, when interpreting something, interpret it in good faith with like evolutive approaches just to understand it better to make it more precise in a good way. So I think that's really important. Um. So about us going back to the moon, I'm I'm curious, what are your thoughts about it? Um, how do you feel? Uh, there's so much opinion about it. Um, I think it's a good thing, of course. You know, I don't like have specific feelings about it. like, of course, I'm up for it. You know, I'm a space kid, you know, um, I would love humans to have, uh, you know, an opportunity to explore more again. Um, to maybe settle even, you know, to research, to, you know, uh, expand to different, you know, planets uh, and even moon, you know. So I'm actually really happy about it, you know, interested to see how it goes, to follow up on the missions and everything, um, you know, hoping to see as the time goes more diverse, you know, teams, um, you know, more accessible trainings, for astronauts or for tourist astronauts, money-wise and also feasibility-wise, you know, especially for underdeveloped and developing countries, I'm really excited to see how the space powers handle it and uh, what they provide as helps the help and opportunities. There are some like ASA is really active in that in that aspect, you know. For example, um, providing more inclusivity, a lot of projects, you know. And Space Generation Advisory Council also is really active in engaging young communities. So I would love to see like more diversity when it comes to like astronaut programs, more visibility, more open ability and access. Um, like it's really beautiful to see like a person of color in space, a woman in space. It would be an amazing thing to see. Um, I would love to see artists in space as well. You know, those are creative minds. And uh, when you build a community, you need to have diversity. You need to have a multicultural and multidisciplinary aspect of it. You really need to take everything in consideration. But practically, at some point after research and everything, it will end up as building communities. I do believe in it. That's why I'm uh, helping out and following the project of the United uh, Space Team to see how it goes You know, in developing countries and to see whether I can facilitate and help do feasibility studies Currently, I'm in India actually doing a feasibility study for opening up an agency here, connecting to people. I, you mentioned, uh, you know, about some countries having like issues with human rights and and not being active in space. 
uh, you know, I have talked to some people that are wondering about uh, priorities and timing. Um, you know, does it make sense for us to be going back to the moon whenever we have like these human right issues and poverty issues and issues with the environment and, and things like this? And I was just wondering in your mind, how do we balance sort of uh, dealing with the problems that we have all around us versus exploring? I think that space can help Earth and Earth can help space. So I don't think uh, projects such as those are mutually exclusive. Uh, just if I'm not like a leader of a state, so I wouldn't know. But I guess just the money has to be distributed in proper funds and proper ways in a transparent manner. And the entire community, diverse experts have to be engaged in order to be just objective, neutral, and assess things properly and objectively. No, I don't think... Uh, I don't think uh, we should stop thinking about tomorrow because we did not think about today in time yesterday, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I think we should definitely think about the moon now because we didn't think about Earth and about Mother Nature and time. And there are crises all over the world. There is dirt, there is trash. There is people, you know, not aware of stuff. And I think we have to find a balance you know, and maybe just raise awareness and the developing countries try to engage them. People sometimes just want to be engaged, to feel empowered. I'm sorry, <laughs> to feel empowered. And it's like a busy, busy city. This is Mumbai for you and uh, everybody's active now. Um, so I just think people need to collaborate, be really transparent, keep in mind future generations, and then they're going to achieve complete clarity, you know, what we need to do. No, it cannot be late. We have to do we have to wake up. So I don't think it's a bad thing. I don't definitely think this needs to be appropriately done. You know, you cannot stop thinking about Earth. And of course, because of satellites, you know, space also helps Earth as well. It's mutually beneficial. That makes sense. Uh, and uh, just thinking about the future a little bit, if you were to kind of envision what the, the world is like in 200 years, what do you imagine? Well, there are two scenarios. One I don't really like, a dystopian one, which the community um, keeps talking about this, um, let's say, utilitarian, beautiful, uh, sorry, uh, uh, this beautiful one, like imaginative one, idealistic version. And then actually what is going on, it's more talking. It's like it should be acta non verba, guess this non, uh, non verbis. So, um, I think how I imagine the world tomorrow, what I want it to be, I can say that, definitely. I see it as us getting back to our roots, getting back to our beginnings, um, getting that connection with nature back and connection between us, among each other back. Because I think we lost it during COVID, during isolation, because of crises and wars, you know, food problems and uh, poverty. I think we kind of lost touch uh between among ourselves where many humans and underdeveloped countries are kind of living for tomorrow just with survival i'm going to call it survival instincts uh, but just to shorten um but pretty much like living for tomorrow and if you don't take them into consideration and help them wherever they are in my country in your country in africa india i don't know you know you need to consider everything in a timely matter and include people. You would be amazed what minds exist in India, for example, and for now, and how much they want to be engaged, actually. Actually speed up the process of everything. So how I see the world tomorrow is like more transparency, what I would want it to be, more engagement, us getting back to ourselves, to our true nature, to where we belong, um, listening to what nature actually is telling us, you know, and believing, you know, in a better tomorrow and then just collaborating on it, not just living for tomorrow, tomorrow, but like for the future, thinking of future generations and not being extreme in either type of activism and, or, or like in business, just taking the pyramid into account, greening the businesses, making the businesses more sustainable, but also business is helping, helping environment and helping the society. So let's say the old three pillars work in a perfect balance. I would love to see people back in villages, working, making tomatoes, 
planting trees, planting everything themselves. And I believe in many states that has has already started thanks to many activists, many companies. So partially I'm very proud, but I think we have a long way to go. Yeah, definitely. I often thought, you know, before we uh, put a village on Mars, we should have a Martian village on Earth where, you know, people are having to, to live in sort of that uh, self-sustaining, self-supporting way. Actually, Nathan, you're reading my mind. <laughs> I'm agreeing completely with this. And again, this is the project of United Space Team. We're gathering and networking, uh, providing opportunities by, uh, let's say, expanding some businesses in underdeveloped markets. And we do have amazing architects that want to build like, like space valleys and stuff like that. We have like, I mean, they have, but let's say we, because I'm kind of part of the team now, a bundle of patents and uh I think they have a lot to provide and help out. So I'm definitely for this. I think you need to practice on Earth in order to get to space. And uh, I think and then if it cannot be used for space for any reason, like missions don't work or I don't know, it's not transferable there. I think you still need to make it here to try to make it work there and it can be then used on Earth, you know, as well. Like, let's say some girls are making biopods. We have a similar thing that we're working on. Um, space villages as well, you know, space parks, sustainable living, um, like try and closed, half open, half closed environments, tunnels and stuff like that. So I think that should be definitely explored, even living underground. We have a lot of beautiful caves around the world that can be also explored, practiced through that, you know. So I don't know why I would go to a jungle to practice, you know, and make myself stronger or just change territories to make myself stronger and practically doing it now and, uh, you know, practice yoga and learn other con uh, cultures as well. Try to understand myself better and the world we're in. Right. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, If you could, would you take a trip to space? I would, but I think I have a lot to finish here help you know to try to help. let's say to try to help to try to contribute and then maybe a bit later I would you know if I could if I could do something smart along the way <laughs> you know if I could contribute somehow by that trip just for a touristic joyride not really interested you know too pricey for me <laughs> at least that if not for other reasons well, uh, Tamara, that's pretty much all the questions I had. Um, is there something you wanted to talk about that we didn't get to? How is NASA? Is it fun? <laughs> it's it's great. Um, it's uh, really, uh, I really like my team. Uh, they're very uh, supportive. Everybody's like nice. um, helping each other out all the time. Um, it's really uh, fascinating looking at uh, kind of like all the systems that have to be maintained to support the International Space Station and the way those teams communicate. And it, I think more of the job is, is around how to communicate um, within teams and uh, kind of teamwork than anything else. So, but it's, it's been great. Yeah. So I remember that the ISS was supposed to go down at some point and then it had that uh, problem with debris hitting it. Um, how do you think... Uh, that can be worked on more when it comes to physical security of the stage, or maybe, uh, you know, reworking on it, making it stronger, or is it going to come down and uh, another one is going to be sent? I didn't really follow up uh, after after the last thing that I know, didn't have time from other stuff. But uh, is it going to come down and at which point, and if, with, what is it going to be replaced with? Is it just going to be reused? That would be cool. Do you know? Uh uh, so the current plans are to deorbit the International Space Station in 2030, and um, and uh, by that time we hope to have private space stations in orbit. There's uh, I think about four different companies that are looking at putting uh, stations in orbit, and so NASA would then at that point uh, plan to uh -huh. to rent uh, time and space uh, on those space stations. So that's that's the current plan. Um, and this year's budget, um, you know, it's like a, a hundred plus million dollars that's been requested for uh, developing a, a space tug to actually deorbit the space station. I think the original plan was to use the the Russian um, segment, um, but but now the thoughts are that 
uh, we should develop something that would allow for us to independently deorbit the station. Um, one of those uh, space stations is being developed by a company called Axiom Space. I know what that's coming out. And so the, uh, their first step is actually going to be developing a module that will be part of the International Space Station. And then at some point, um, they'll build up the, that set of modules enough so it could be independent with its own power and cooling and communications and everything. Mm -hmm. And they'll detach that um, set of modules from the International Space Station. And then um, that will be uh, its own private space station. And then you also have like uh, Blue Origin and... Sierra Nevada yeah. and a few other companies doing like Orbital Reef. Uh, it's another mm -hmm. um, a company. And I think there's a, a couple more though. I would have to check to see what their names were. So another thing about the space debris, what are the current developments? How is that being um, currently resolved? Cause I know that there's like the extended hand, the magnets, the web, there were been like, and the time I was analyzing it, writing about it, then I jumped to other topics. Um, but at the time, which was, I think, 2020, that's what I found. Um, so how is that uh, developing now and progressing? Do you have some ready, uh, ready machinery that can be employed that has been tested sufficient time that actually works? Or are we just going to make a huge ring out of it and just call it a highway? Yeah. Well, that's a good question. I mean, you know, um, below a certain altitude, everything will deorbit by itself. Uh, there, uh, even where the International Space Station is, there's there's enough air molecules that uh, it has to be um, intentionally reboosted uh, to keep it at its current uh, orbit. Uh, so, um, you know, a lot of these problems will will uh, take care of themselves over time. The question is, is that time you know, 10 years, 100 years, 1,000 years, or a million years, you know. Um, yeah, but still, we have the Kessler syndrome, you know, which is a theoretical scenario, but still, you know, at those speeds, at those heights, such significant amount of, you know, trash, basically almost like a sudden ring, um, you know, maybe time is not our friend, you know, <laughs> who knows? Yes, we have a lot of sea, but that also might changed by mother nature we never know you know it was raining in mumbai and not raining season you know just a few days ago so <laughs> i don't know um what what do you think uh, how does nasa see these uh tests and uh for space debris removal what companies are you working with do you have your own patents in this area what do you guys do about it nowadays yeah, I don't know that much about it. I do know that um, in order to get like a launch license uh, now to actually put your satellite into orbit, you need to have a plan to deorbit it, uh, which, yes. you know, that's a big improvement. Um, that's true. Yeah, that's great. In terms of the International Space Station, I mean, um, our big uh, thing is to actually monitor all the space debris and to avoid it. <laughs> so, that's the same. you know, we're, yeah. we're constantly... Um, uh, you know, kind of uh, doing maneuvering uh, to either be above or below uh, the, the space debris. And, and there's a lot of it. And, you know, sometimes um, you're able to, to, to find it and predict it well in advance, and sometimes you don't. I mean, as you um, talked about um, back in December, uh, the Russians had a Soyuz, um, um, you know, uh, uh, module a Soyuz uh, capsule that was attached to the International Space Station that had a coolant leak, and they believe mm -hmm. that was from um, um, a, a, a meteor. They think it was actually from a meteor that wasn't in orbit around the Earth. Um, mm -hmm. So it wouldn't really be the type of thing that you would expect for a space debris conversation. But then more yeah. recently, they had another um, uh, coolant leak, which they also think came from impact on a, a progress. Um, you know, spacecraft. So, mm -hmm. so it's mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting. I mean, the, the yeah, these are really interesting topics. Uh, like, you really got want to get engaged, you know, when talking about it. So that's cool. Uh, a lot of uh, interesting information. Thank you. <laughs> um, I I think I believe I have a lot of questions, but um. I don't know, do you think it was it would be possible for people who are like foreigners and new in space to have some visitations in some of NASA's headquarters or just offices somewhere so I can kind of talk with somebody 
in person one day any day <laughs> um yeah i don't know what that process uh, looks like i imagine there's like um maybe contacting like the public affairs office and trying to um connect through that way but probably more effectively is to uh, look on linkedin and and find uh individuals that that you think um would be interested and then uh, you can reach out to them one-on-one -on -one. Yes. that's that's kind of um what I, I generally do um yeah pretty much all of us ai helps us find people today <laughs> so <laughs> Okay, I really enjoyed this. I hope you did as well. If you have what any additional questions, I know I have a ton, so I'm not gonna keep you just might text you the questions later. <laughs> well, it sounds good. Well, tomorrow enjoy your team. Enjoy your time in India, and <laughs> um, and I, I hope everything goes well. And I thank you so much for meeting up with me. Thank you. Namaste. <laughs> Namaste. Bye bye. Bye.